So, everybody, welcome to the Bite Back webinar. This is our first ever one that we've done, and we hope it all runs smoothly for this first one. So, we are going to have three presentations today. One is on the dog fence rebuild. The other is on the new dog disease that's emerged in Australia for the first time and on bait preparation, transport and storage. Just some housekeeping things first. So I'm going to ask everyone to turn their microphones and cameras off during the presentation, just so that people with small bandwidths can actually actually have all the um, presentations heard without it stuttering or fading out on them. Um, I'm also that doesn't prevent you from asking questions. Once the presentation is ended, we're going to have five minutes of questions or longer if everyone has lots of questions on those ones. And feel free to ask those as verbally. You can just unmute yourself and if you want, you can turn your, ca your camera on. Otherwise, we do have a chat function. So it's at, located either at the top of your screen or it will be a pop up little bar that disappears when you haven't moved your mouse for a little bit and it's a chat bubble there. You can type questions in there and I'll read them out at, during the question time if you don't feel like verbally speaking them. Otherwise, you can have a conversation in there <laughs> during the presentation as a reminder of, um, of the notes if you want those. We also, you can also raise your hand if you want to ask a question verbally and that's the little emoji smiley face that has a hand up above it if you want to raise that and I'll call on you so we are only having one person talking at once. So our first presenter for today is Dr. Alison Crawley. She's from Biosecurity and I'll let her give a little spiel about who she is. Hi there everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to chat to you tonight. I'm a vet by training. Um, I've worked in biomedical research um, in overseas in developing countries um, and within Australia on dog health programs in remote communities. Um, and I currently work at PERSA in biosecurity and have been involved in the Alikia Canis surveillance. Um, project. So that's what I was going to talk to you about today. So should I just sort of go ahead with that, Anna? I think she's yep. saying yes. Yep. yep. <laughs> Let me, now this is, I'm worried my bandwidth is not happy, but anyway, um, we'll see how we go. And if it's now, this is when I change it. Okay. So this was up in the APY lands when we were sampling. So tick sickness in dogs, um, Elichia canis in South Australia. So that's what I was going to talk to you about. So I was just going to give you a quick overview of what it is and how it's transmitted. Um, an update on what's happened in the Australian outbreak symptoms of disease, diagnosis and prevention. And I'll probably forget to talk about dingoes and wild dogs. So somebody can ask that in the questions if I forget. So what is ehrlichiosis? Um, it's pronounced ehrlichiosis. Um, so I think you can get your head around that now. And it's actually a little bacteria um, called ehrlichia canis and it lives in the blood of infected dogs. And you can see the sort of uh, light pinky gray circles and blobs. They're your red blood cells in a blood smear. And then the more purple, um, bigger circles with darker purple blobs in the middle are um, white blood cells. And then in the red circle, are, um, some what they call morula from the uh, Lichia canis bacteria. So that's, you can, it's a bit hard to see on a blood smear, but it is possible in some cases. Oops, now let me just go next. So how is sorry, Elisa, awesome. just, yeah, yeah. Sorry. sorry, we've just, uh, I'm not seeing your slides come up. Is the only thing. Oh. 
Okay, let me let me just do that. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Let's um, try that. It's Greg here. I'm seeing them just by clicking on the forward and backward button. Uh, there was I had the out forward arrows. So as Alison was talking, I was clicking through to what she was saying. Uh, slide two. That shouldn't, that shouldn't be how it works. But anyway, right. um, okay. learning curve for all of us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know how. Yeah, I'm like on this one. I'm assuming you can see five slides. Is that correct? Nope, just the one. Just the one. Ah, oh, okay. We're so looking at see. slide three of eighteen at the moment. Oh, perfect. The, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that was the the um the red blood cells and white blood cells with the ehrlichia morally on in the white blood cells, which is in a circle. So it's little bacteria, and then if we move on to um. How is it transmitted? So we call it tick sickness, um, if we can't pronounce the name. Um, and it's actually what we call a tick-borne disease. And there's other tick-borne diseases that you might be familiar with involving cattle. Um, but this disease is spread specifically by brown dog ticks. Um, just species of tick spreads it. Uh, the species of tick is Rupicephalus linnaei. Um, and the most important thing to remember is it cannot be transmitted directly from dog to dog. So um, what I've written in the box there, Ehrlichia canis is only transmitted through the bite of an infected tick, which is carrying the bacteria. So that's the only way a dog can get it, is um, the tick has to transfer it. So where is Ehrlichia canis in the world? Um, red patches are where it's been detected. The green patches where it's not known to be present, and the grey patches are um, they haven't looked till April 2020. Australia was green. Um, nothing patch, nothing had been detected. Um, now, oh, oh, this is not. Can you hear me? <laughs> yep, you're breaking up a little bit, but still hearing you. Yep. Have I lost you, Alison? Uh, do you mean... Sorry about that. So, Alison, it looks like we may have lost your screen, but um, that's fixed up your vocal stuff. I'm just going to stop sharing if we <laughs> can see that. <laughs> ah, dear. Okay. About that, am I back? Yep, but we can't see a screen. No, because I stopped sharing. Yep. <laughs> so there we go. There's my internet quality. Um, Anna, I'm just wondering, would it pay for us to move on to Lindell's presentation and see if we can try to work out something with Alison? Perhaps if we um, show her presentation and change the slides for her, that might work. Yep. <laughs> Gonna love internet. It always screws up on someone. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Lindell, you. Wanting to go first this time? 
Sure. Okay, I'll give it a go. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Yes. Good. So yeah. my name's Lynn, Linda Landry. Yeah. I work um, cool. in the biosecurity division of PERSA as well. Um, my background, I was a, a zookeeper and then just worked in the zoo industry for about 16 years, largely to do with species management and collection management. I then uh, moved into wildlife ecology and did a lot of field work um, across Australia, also overseas, and uh, did that for, I oh, no, about 10 years or so. But of course, when you do wildlife ecology, you very quickly move into pest animals. Uh, and so then I moved across to biosecurity, where I'm a biosecurity officer uh, as my substantive position, but um, am doing the rebuild of the dog fence now. So that's a four-year position just during the lifetime of this project. So I'm going to turn my video off and hopefully share my screen and we'll go through the rebuild of the dog fence. Okay, so can everyone see that? Has that worked, Anna? Yes. Yep. Sorry. Okay, excellent. Yes, I can see it. <laughs> okay, perfect. So the dog fence in South Australia is about 2,150 kilometres and it goes from uh, the Great Australian Bight across to the New South Wales border and just weaves its way along what originally was a whole heap of just vermin-proof fences set up by individual properties um, back in the early 1900s when I think rabbits largely you know, dropped in their numbers as did dogs. Uh, and, and people you know, were off to war and everything. The maintenance on those individual vermin-proof fences uh, wasn't maintained, and so they decided to get together, pick a route, and make that a state um, dog fence, I guess. The Dog Fence Act came in in 1946, uh, and today that act still exists, and it requires a dog-proof fence to be maintained across South Australia. Uh, that is managed largely by the dog fence, the local dog fence boards. So there's four local dog fence boards at the moment, plus one section of the fence, which is privately owned. And the maintenance of the fence, which is about $1.2 million each year, comes from uh, rates that people in appropriate areas pay, as well as contributions from the sheep industry fund, um, and then a match, a dollar match for match by the government, the state government. So that's how it's maintained. But that's not... It's just enough money really to maintain it. And over the past, you know, because some of the fence is 100 years old, we've still got a lot of fence that is the old cut posts. Um, there are sections that over the years have become brittle. They've been really impacted by pressure from not only wild dogs, but camels, donkeys, horses, kangaroos, emus, um, also impacted by floods and sand erosion. And so it got to the point where we couldn't just rely on that 1.1, million to fix it. Um, we identified about two thirds, so that's 1,600 kilometres where it really desperately needed to be rebuilt. And so um, obviously we weren't looking for that money. We got $10 million from the federal government, 10 million from the state government and 5 million from industry. So it's a $25 million project to rebuild 1,600 kilometres of fence. And that's 1,600 kilometres of fence. Some of it is a complete rebuild. Some of it is just a partial rebuild. But it's a, the biggest investment that we've had into the dog fence in its entire life. Uh. Uh, Lindell, sorry to interrupt there. It's Chris. Um, oh, there we go. I wasn't seeing any slides move. I wasn't sure if that was just my computer. No, no, I, I was just on that title page why I gave the um, introduction. Sure, sorry for interrupting. That's all right. So the project is managed or overseen by a rebuild committee. So it's not um, necessarily a PERSA targeted project. The management team is in within PERSA, but a lot of the decisions and the oversight and the historic decision making with regard to the designs and the materials have been made by this rebuild committee. Now the rebuild committee provides a strategic direction to the minister so working upwards, but also working downwards. It works closely with the pastoralists and the other stakeholders. So the people who are impacted by the quality of this dog fence. And specifically, it's made up of the chair of the South Australian Dog Fence Board, the chairs of the four local dog fence boards, the private owner, 
a representative from Livestock SA, which at the moment is the president, and as I said, it's supported by PERSA staff. So we do all the admin, I manage it, I have an on-ground inspector as well, but we meet as a committee and um, we draw on the experience of all those chairs and, and private owners, most of which have properties either right on the fence or very close to the fence. Uh, and it's also their responsibilities to talk to their stakeholders. So we're getting information fed up from across the whole pastoral region, as well as just the livestock industry as well. So one of the things we did early on is we had to come up with a standard design that we were going to go with that would fit our budget. Um, we know that uh, the likes of New South Wales have a very good fence, but they also have a very big budget. So we came up with um, what we call our standard design, which you can see on the screen. Um, it's a 1.5 metre high fence. Uh, someone can't see my slides. Does anyone have any suggestions? Did, can everyone see my slides? Uh, I can. It's okay. just it Alison at the moment. Okay. We're having a little bit of trouble there. I'll play around. Um, I can. Okay. So it might just be Alison. Um, so the 1.5 metre high, uh, the posts are seven metres apart. It's a prefabricated mesh 15 150 15, which will mean something to fencing people with an attached 400 mil lap. Um, we have drill rod as our core uh, posts every 28 metres with two small and one large dropper in between that. Uh, in some section of the fence, we have the belly wires at about 100, 700 and 1500 meter, uh, millimetres above ground level, but not in all sections. And that was the, the big thing we wanted to make sure we could do was we had a standard fence, but we had to make sure it was flexible enough to deal with different terrains, different substrates, different animal pressures, and also just the preferences of the different local dog fence boards and the people who actually you know, we're working with this fence or relying on this fence. And so that means in some areas, you know, we can add a barbed wire to the top or we can um, bury the, the lap into the ground or we can remove the uh, droppers and use latch posts, which means we don't need belly wires. So it's a flexible design, but it's a standard design that we know um, is still good, dog proof, but fits in our budget as well, which clearly that's an important thing. So this is um, a picture of the dog fence. Now the colours um, in the fence itself are, are kind of give us a bit of priority on where we start to build or what's important to get done first and what's not. Now clearly the red bits are the most important one, followed by um, the orange, the yellow and then the white. And so the bits that we are rebuilding are the red, the orange and the yellow. Now, priority wise, we didn't just start at one end and go to the other end. We then looked at not only what needed doing as far as the condition of the fence, but also what pressures we were seeing on that fence from animals. And we know animals move um, and sometimes we see a lot of them in one area and a lot and, and not in others and then vice versa um, at other times of the year. So we really uh, plan ahead about 12 months at a time based on the condition of the fence the animals, and it also might be impacted by weather conditions. So you can see there the stages, well, all the little numbers are the sections, and they help me identify um, differences in fence condition, but the stages are the order that we've gone ahead and built them in. So stage one and two, the first two sections that we built are over in the northeast pastoral, and we started with a really small section. Stage one, you can see, is actually only 26 kilometres, and we did that because it gave us the opportunity to trial our uh, design, to trial the materials, to work out how much it was really going to cost, and just to make another few tweaks and make sure everything was happy with us. And that proved to be a really valuable thing to do rather than just launch into a really big section. So stage um, one and two in the northeast pastoral, stage three and four up in the Maree, local dog fence board area, as you can see, working west, you know, five is northwest of Roxby, and then our next few are over in the um, Pariba local dog fence board area. 
So as I said, um, we've got 25 million to spend over four years. Uh, so the project, the project itself started back in about May 2019, as far as that's when we got the money. The first build started in May 2020. So we've been building fences since May 2020. Uh, it took a lot of work to get everything off the ground. Uh, we have two panels of suppliers, so we had to go through a whole tender process to appoint uh, what is 13 fencing contractors and 13 suppliers of materials, and then every single stage goes out to them uh, to put in an offer. And the panels work well because it means that we're always going to get some offers. Sometimes people are just not um, available or don't have the materials we'll need um, or they it's too far for them to travel. So there's varying reasons why people don't put in an offer every time. So although we might have 13 suppliers on our panels or, or 12 suppliers, we certainly don't get 13 offers every single time. But we still get enough that makes it a competitive um, a request for quote series. So anyway, to date we've spent over 5 million, which is about 20% of the budget. And we're building at an average cost of about 15,600 a kilometre. And that's all your materials, all your fencing contractors, and all the earthworks. We have to do an awful lot of earthworks in our fence compared to maybe Queensland, where you might have heard about the exclusion fencing, and certainly um, even compared to some of the work they do in Western Australia. So as of today, we've done about 300 kilometres, which doesn't sound like much, um, but we've also probably got about another 460 kilometres underway at the moment. And so, you know, that will be finished most likely uh, by at least the end of this financial year. And at the same time, we're rolling through with more um, that are in the middle of procurement or about to start, um, and, and that just keeps rolling through. So part of our government process in procurement, particularly when we're doing dealing with such expensive um, procurements, is that I, I have to go through approval processes first. So we've got approvals already to spend $23 million of projects. So I can just roll through and put out those requests for quotes for materials first and then fencing contractors after that. So this is a map to basically show you where we're at at the moment. The dark green is what we have finished. Uh, the light green is what we have underway at the moment. So you can see there's a lot of fence already where there's contractors on the ground just working through it. Um, there's nothing about to commence. That would be orange. And the pink stuff is where I'm just finalising suppliers now. So as you can see, it's it's starting to really you know, hit the ground running now um, and it just ticks over quite nicely. So what we're looking for when we do these... Um, uh, put out these requests for quotes each time. Now we know this panel, people on the panel can already provide us with the correct materials or have the experience in fencing. Um, and the big thing for fencing was that they could work in remote areas. We, it's all very well to say you can fence, but you also have to be self-sufficient in these very remote areas. So um, the big thing with materials, as well as meeting our conditions, is that they can supply the quantity of materials we need in the time frame. And, we're quite often talking about each stage needing five to eight road trains of materials. It's a lot of stuff to ship in. Um, those That picture you can see on the side there is stage two, and it's only the first drop of stage two. Uh, the fencing contractors, as I said, one of the main things was that they could build to specification. So to our design that we created, they could uh, work in a remote area and they can build within our appropriate time frame. Price obviously is an important consideration. It's probably our most important consideration, but it's not the only thing that we consider. And of course, one of the other really important things for us is whether a product or a fencing company is based in South Australia. So any proportion of a product that's made from South Australian largely raw materials, because there's actually any fencing manufacturers in South Australia, um, and also fencing contractors are based in South Australia, that helps with our industry participation. So to date, we've certainly experienced some challenges and uh, without doubt, they have slowed us up. We've had uh, six different rain events, funnily enough, despite the fact before we were talking about drought, um, six different rain events that not only impact us here in South Australia, but even rain over in the East Coast will slow our uh, materials down because uh, some of our wire manufacturers are based on the East Coast. And so there was uh, one 
uh, one period there where we couldn't get stuff out of New South Wales, let alone getting it into South Australia and into these remote properties where you certainly don't have the roads and the tracks that are, are weatherproof or all weather. So rain certainly slowed us up. We had uh, wharf strikes in Sydney earlier this year, I think you might remember, that slowed some of our product coming in from overseas. Um, so to be clear, we do get most of our stuff from Australia, uh, certainly all the wire, all um, the drill rod, most of the droppers. It's just smaller bits and pieces like gates and latches, hinges, um, weld mesh, that kind of stuff, no one in Australia actually makes it. So you do have to import some stuff. It's all very idealistic to say it's all Australian made, but it's not because people in Australia don't make it. Uh, not with not um, commercial off the shelf anyway. So war strikes impact, even if it's only a small amount of materials. Uh, we've had pollution restrictions slow things down. So Chinese ports often um, are limited. And if their pollution levels go too high, they have to shut up for a few days. There is a container shortage you may have heard about on international um, shipping routes. Uh, deliveries, we've sometimes struggled to get either trucks suitable to come to the remote areas or they've missed materials and left them um, at the stores uh, and sometimes they're just not well prepared for the environments that um, they're supposed to be travelling in and that slows them up. And of course the other thing we're dealing with is increasing steel prices. So uh, we have to juggle all this all the time as well as just all some of the minor things that we come up against every single week. So I'm just going to go through some of, uh, back to each of those local boards and the areas through the fence and just give you, I guess, a bit of a more um, uh, intense or localised update on where we're at. So starting over on the east side there, the Frome Local Dog Fence Board, as I said, that's where we did our first two stages and that was Arudna to the New South Wales um, border. And that did include a realignment of the fence, which meant it goes straight to the New South Wales border now and doesn't have a dog leg in it. And that has reduced the overall length of the South Australian dog fence by about 30 kilometres. Now, there's a 15 kilometre section adjacent to Kernamona um, Station, which just had a lap replaced. It hasn't worked um, quite to plan. As I said, this was a first section, so it's a good trial. So we do have to go back and revisit that lap. Um, this fence will become the new dog fence officially once the New South Wales fence has extended down. So you might have heard that New South Wales is extending their wild dog exclusion fence, I, called, I think it's called over there, uh, 377 kilometres towards the Murray River. It's not built yet and until it's built, our new section of fence is not our dog fence, it's still the old section of fence. Uh, and we have approvals for that, uh, what's in almost 200 kilometres of fence in that northeast pastoral. So looking at some of those photos, the top left is um, really demonstrates, I guess, the easy wire machine. So the Australian Wool Innovation have lent us that machinery you can see that's rolling out that prefabricated mesh under tension. And that makes it much quicker to put the fence up. Now that's on offer to the fencing contractors. They don't have to use it, but if they do use it, we certainly expect to see a reduction in their price because of course we're paying for the machinery, the registration, the insurance, which all saves them not doing it. Uh, so that machinery was used in stage two. It's also currently being used in stage three, which is the section northeast of Murray. Um, the picture on the top right is just showing the scale of that's that's half the fencing contractors camp. So there was also two other containers which house accommodation, kitchens, bathrooms, things like that. Uh, and he has a semi trailer to move his equipment around. So they're big projects. They come in with big equipment and lots of it. Um, it's not just a matter of packing up a small trailer and heading up. It costs them probably seven to ten thousand dollars just to set up camp. Um, the bottom right is the old fence being pushed up alongside the new fence. So typically we always build the new fence next to the old fence and then take the old fence down later. But of course there are some situations where that's just not practical and in which case they'll take the old fence down but they'll only ever take as much down that they can rebuild in a day. So the fence is never left open overnight. And certainly if there was any need for it to be left open, we increase baiting in the area as well. The bottom left is just um, a picture from the uh, Mullyungary Tower looking at the new fence. 
working west, the Mare Local Dog Fence Board. So in that photo there, that's Peter Litchfield, who's the chair of that board, also has property on the fence. And the gentleman on the uh, right is Ian Evans from Australian Wool Innovation. So Mundarna is underway. Maluruna is completed. That was stage three and four in that order. In Maluruna, we did a trial of burial of the lap. So we've buried the lap 25 kilometres in that section because there's a big history there of dogs being um, digging under the fence. We typically don't bury the lap for quite a few reasons, um, but it is a case by case basis. And if the local board comes to us with a very good reason why we should do some burying, we do. Uh, we have a, a proposed realignment of the fence there and the Phoenix Springs Kalana boundary. Now it won't be far, but it will get us out of some very terrible big floodways. And we also already have the approvals to build that Kalana section of fence. So the top left picture there is the buried fence. That's the section of the fence with the buried lap. The top right just shows some of the hideous country that this, that's stage three, that rocky country. Um, and it hasn't been easy to drive the posts into that rocky ground. So they actually have to use a rock drill in part of that. Uh, the bottom left is again, the old fence and the new fence. And the bottom right, again, that's Peter Litchfield and Jeff Power. So Jeff Power is the chair of the SA Dog Fence Board. Central Local Dog Fence Board is uh, up Roxby Way. Mount Ebe Millers Creek section is underway at the moment at 196 kilometres. It is our largest section to date. Um, it runs through the prominent hill line and also the uh, Woomera protected area. So we have to deal with um, working alongside and within their requirements and the restrictions as well. Uh, and they have both been ridiculously helpful. So it's it's lovely to work with some really good people. Oz Minerals have also donated some drill rod to the project too, which is great because uh, drill rod is, is scarce at the moment. Uh, there is a realignment here through Millers Creek. It doesn't actually change the length of the fence at all, but it takes it out of some really short, sharp, rocky country. Um, and again, we've got approvals completed for another 155K that I can just get going with when we get to that stage. So the top, um, top left picture is showing some of that country we're moving the, the fence out of. So you can see how that would be really hard to build in and, and more so, and more importantly, really hard to maintain in the long term. Um, top uh, right is just showing a bit of what the, the fence is like at the moment. You can see that it's really um, an old, fairly flimsy mesh. The posts aren't particularly strong. It's got patches in it um, and, of course, a little bit of sand. The bottom left is uh, one of the big floodways. We've got about three kilometres of really big, long flood plains at the top section of this where the water will just sit there for months and so um, that's enough to make the ground soft that means that posts will bend and push over so it doesn't go through quickly it goes through really slowly and this is one of the challenges is that every single floodway and creek line is different so we really rely on a lot of local knowledge to get um, the flood gates or flood plains fixed and, and you know suitable for each environment at the bottom right is well myself in front and then Jeff Thomas. So as I mentioned earlier on, we do have an inspector, uh, a person, employee, inspector, rebuild of the dog fence is his title and he's my on-ground contact. Uh, he helps all the contractors, helps all the truck drivers, the suppliers. Uh, he talks to the pastoralists, he signs off on the work um, and he oversees all the work. So he's uh, absolutely uh, irreplaceable and valuable person. The private section, so this is the section that's owned by Jumbuck Pastoral. They still look after their own section of fence. Uh, currently, we're doing Malbuma, which is a mix of steel and wood. So anywhere that there is saline soils uh, and particularly salt lakes, we build with wooden posts. Uh, everywhere else is steel posts. So there's a small section in the current um, Malbuma section, which has got wood posts. Everything else is steel. It's also our first section where we're building with electric fencing as well. Uh, so the electric fencing is in addition to the normal fence and we're doing it for wombats and camels in that area. Uh, the railway line works through there. So we've got to work with the Australian Rail Transport Corporation. Um, and as you can see that there's an awful lot of uh, more fencing to be done up there so that uh, that's all approved and ready to go as well. And I've just started working on the Malgathing section. 
So top left is clearly the railway. Um, it needs some very much better uh, box assemblies and end assemblies there. Top right is them laying out the electric fencing for the wombats. Um, that's and just got about two and a half kilometres and of electric fencing either side. We'll just try and keep the wombats off the fence. The bottom left is the wooden post section by the Salt Lake. And the bottom right, you can just see what the old fence was like and particularly the level of vegetation that um, we're having to deal with up there. And the final uh, board is the Penong, so the one that goes right to the coast. Um, we're doing some preparatory earthworks now for the section that goes through Pariba. So that's a lot of conservation park in this section um, and some big sand dunes. So we're doing some clay topping now. Um, we've worked really closely with the uh, Far West Coast Aboriginal Corporation, Yambara Co-Management Board to get approval to dig holes in the um, conservation park there to grab some clay so we can top the sand hills now let it really settle and compact down and we'll probably start that rebuild in April next year. Uh, we've ordered 60,000 wooden posts because this entire section through the Penong board is all wood posts because it's so um, saline. So there we've already got about 42,000 of them delivered, which is great because we were, were expecting uh, supply issues after all the bushfires in Australia what, 18 months ago. Penong procurement is underway. I've already just about to appoint a supplier of materials and then I'll move on to the fencing contractors. Um, we had a really terrible grid on the old air highway which we worked with Department of Infrastructure and Transport to replace um, and I've already got the approvals ready for Lake Everard which um, will be after the Malgathing section. So in that photo you can see um, top uh, sorry, top left is just what the fence looks like currently, but you can see that it's in your conservation park on both sides. But you can also see what I mean by the sand building up on the sections there. If you go down and look at the bottom right, that's a sand hill we've just clay topped. So that gives it a much firmer ground for when we come back and build the fence. The other two photos are just illustrations of what the fence currently looks like. And of course, you can see that it clearly needs to be rebuilt. Uh, and so the, the rebuild of the fence really is just the first stage in um, control of dogs in South Australia. And so the other things that we've got going on at the moment, uh, we've got the World Dog Trapping Program, which is a combined $1.4 million that started in 2018. We've got the World Dog Bounty, which is uh, every dog is $120 uh, until we get up to, well, it's supposed to be $100,000, sorry, I missed a zero. We have um, coordinated ground baiting, of course, the aerial baiting, and working on currently a 10-year plan to eradicate wild dogs. And so we've costed that at about $15 million. And that's it for me. Thank you. I'll just stop sharing that. Okay. Thank you, Lindell. That was very interesting. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Greg. Um, yes, I, I had a question about the old fence when you take that away. What happens to that? Is it going to just be piled up or is it going to be actually physically removed, the wire, or buried, or how, how are you going to handle that? Because um, we all know what like old fences are like alongside new fences and over the years. Uh, they yeah. can be a trap for livestock and all Correct. that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah no, so it is in each of the fencing contractors under their contract they do have to remove the old fence now it does depend a little bit on where that fence is to what happens with it so our standard is that it's pushed up it's squashed it's then burnt and then a hole is dug and it's squashed in the hole and um, covered over so that's the standard we don't burn in the middle of summer for obvious reasons um, if it can't be buried because the ground is too hot too hard, uh, it just gets pushed up. Uh, and clearly we work with the pastoralists whose land we're working on to make sure that they're happy with where we leave it. Um, there is a section down in the Pariba area, which currently is just 10 line, it's an old 10 line electric fence that is not that active. So we're actually going to roll that up and then tender it out for someone who may want to just buy fence that's ready to roll out and erect again. So there's different methods um, for different fencing and depending on where we are, but most of it is certainly uh, pushed up, squashed and burnt and buried. Uh, 
Oh, th thanks for that. Yeah, that's a good explanation. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have any other questions? I've got one. Sure. What ha how long does a clay top last? Like, will it help prevent sand drift for the next five years or will it only for the next year or so? I don't know, but I do think it depends on where it is and how much clay there is used. Um, it seems to last, certainly where they've done it over in the northeast pastoral, it does seem to last a fair while. Um, and certainly if they keep scraping, if they're on top of it, they can take the sand that does build up over the top of it off and then the clay, uh, clay topping is still there. So then it's just a matter of making sure that the sand is removed um, that builds up on top of it. And I do know that uh, with the patrolmen who currently work on the fence, their priorities are going to shift a bit and all well, the maintenance of the fence will shift a bit because obviously if you've got a brand new fence you won't have to do so much patching and increasing height and um, that kind of work so it will be more concentrated on removing the veg making sure veg doesn't build up in the fence because that really increases the rate of corrosion on the fence and it also stops the sand um, which so their sand builds up when there's veg in the fence but one of the other things they'll be more on top of is making sure that sand doesn't even where there's no veg, sand doesn't build up on top of those sand hills as much as it used to. So there'll be a lot more earthworks grading work going on. Yep. No, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Nope. All right. Thank you, Lindell. That was very interesting. You're welcome. I'm going to try. Sorry. I said you're welcome. <laughs> We're going to try take two with Alison. So I'm going to be clicking through the slides and Alison's going to be talking. Sorry, Greg. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, I uh, was. I did make a note. Could you just explain the, the bounty? Did you say $120 per dog? Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, that's right. correct. Yep. And uh, how long will that go for or what's the issue? This is after the fence has been uh, completed, I suppose, on a section. No, this is current now. So if you shoot a dog now, um, there's, there's different uh, specifications that like, you have to do and there's different ways you take a photo or something. I, I don't manage the bounty, so um, I don't have the information off the top of my head, but it's $120 until that $100,000 runs out. Um, right. If you went yep. to the PERSA website, uh, or Chris and Anna could probably send you the details, um, you would find out all the information that you need to do to claim that $120. Yep, okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think at the moment we've got about 50,000 roughly left out of that um, 100,000, so it's still active, definitely at the moment. All right. Alison, are you ready to have another go? All right, can everyone see that one? Yes, I can see that. Yes, Greg. Uh, oh, yes, I can see it. All right, I'm going to hand over to Alison then. You there, Alison? Oh, we seem to have lost her. So, Chris, I might get you to have a give your presentation. We'll try Alison at the end. We seem to have been some internet connection troubles with her. Right, hello everyone. Can you see me on the screen or do I need to share my screen first? Let's have a I look. I can see you. I can't see your screen. 
Okay, no worries. Okay, so for those who don't know me, most people do by now. Um, my name's Chris Havelberg. I'm a Wild Dog Project Officer for the SA Arid Lands Landscape Board. Um, I, my background, I guess I was a park ranger for about eight years and then moved into the um, predator control program and I've been a bite back officer um, for various versions of the board for just over seven years now. Um, so I'm sure my presentation is probably not going to be as exciting as Lindell's, but um, today we're going to talk about, um, and I'll just turn my camera off and bring my screen up. Just bear with me for a second. Can uh, everybody see that? Yep, all good, Chris. Okay, so um, yeah, this presentation, um, Anna put it together. Thank you for that, Anna. Um, she's done most of the work on this. So I'm just the presenting arm of it for tonight. Um, but this sort of came about, um, I don't know if everyone saw in the media uh, down the southeast, there was an issue where a, um, a property uh, was purchased and there was an unlabeled bucket of 1080 oats in the shed. Uh, and of course, um, accidentally, uh, some sheep got into it, and I think about 30 sheep um, perished from eating the oats. Um, so that sort of prompted us to think about, you know, transport and um, uh, correct storage of baits. And we thought it was about time we did a bit of a presentation. Um, uh, just to everyone that was interested on um, correct uh, bait creation, uh, particularly for wild dog control. And this presentation is uh, specific for wild dog control, um, but we also, you know, touch on uh, transport and storage that relates to uh, any type of um, uh, bait, uh, specifically, I suppose, uh, 1080 baits, which is the um, probably the, the main product that we use for most of our dog control stuff um, in SA Arid Lands region. Uh, now is my slides going to change for me? Let's try. Right. Did that change for everyone? Yep, all good. Okay, yep. excellent. Okay, so you can see the silhouettes that are on the slide there. Uh, they're essentially uh, all the animals that can be used or potentially be used to make uh, wild dog baits. Um, you can see the tuna there. That's probably a bit of a rarity. Um, in a previous role as a um, as a conservation park ranger, we did use a bit of tuna for fox control. It's not something that we focused on much um, in SA Arid Lands region, but um, it certainly um, is an option that we could look into in the future. Um, so, uh, really. You know, if anyone has any other ideas or um, access to this, uh, to any sort of meat supply, uh, we would love to know about it because one of the biggest issues for our program um, in the last 12 months is uh, limited access to meat supply to turn into baits. Uh, a lot of our landholders have been having a lot of trouble getting access to it. Uh, but we do inject most types of meat, uh, including hearts um, of any species of the animals that are shown on that, um, that slide. Um, uh, because hearts are technically they're an offal, but they are classified as a muscle. Uh, so the meat uh, must be muscle meat, and that's through the um, the rules and regulations of what we can use to turn into baits. It has to be free of bone, and it has to be free of excess fat. Now the reason it has to be uh, free of excess fat is because 1080 is actually water soluble, and it binds to the meat molecules. So if, um, if there's too much fat on the bait and the, the poison itself is injected into that fat, it doesn't take much water at all um, or rain or anything um, to, um, you know, push that 1080 out of the bait or wash that 1080 out of the bait and make the bait sublethal, which is definitely something that we want to avoid. Uh, we can't inject other offal, such as livers or kidney. Um, they just don't dry out enough to inject. Um, so there is a risk of the poison draining out with any excess blood, uh, making them sublethal as well. So we definitely want to uh, avoid that. Um, and offal is usually broken down by soil microbes and insects very quickly, uh, which can reduce the bait's longevity in the environment and decrease the chance of any dogs coming across them um, while they're still um, uh, a viable bait. So, uh, you know, obviously bait preparation is pretty important and when it comes to baiting, size does matter. 
So uh, baits need to be 150 grams wet weight uh, for them to be injected as dog baits. And the, for reason, and the reason for this is to actually help reduce the risk of non-target animals being able to eat an entire bait in one sitting. So smaller baits, um, uh, usually around that 90 gram uh, mark, can only be injected as fox baits, um, uh, which may not be lethal to larger dogs or adult-sized dogs, and could lead to bait shyness. If a dog, um, you know, if an adult dog picks up a, a bait that has a sublethal amount of 1080 in it that won't um, uh, won't kill the dog, um, it can actually cause that dog to become bait shy and then avoid um, baits in the future. Uh, now, when we talk about the term wet weight, um, we thought it was important to give a definition for that. So that means a bait that's been uh, drained of blood before it's been dried. Um, yeah, so once they've been dried, they'll generally lose up to half of their weight and shrink in size. So, yeah, when we talk about wet weight, uh, it means uh, when excess blood isn't running or dripping out of it, uh, but it hasn't formed a skin or dried off, as you can see in that top right picture um, in the slideshow. Uh, the other baits on that screen, you can see they're fresh meat baits. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about them a little bit, I think, coming up on one of the next slides. Uh, so as I mentioned on the last slide, with baits, size does matter. So uh, a dog bait should be roughly the size of a fist or a large packet of cigarettes. Um, as I mentioned before, the precaution is to reduce the risk of any off-target species being able to swallow the bait whole or eat an entire bait in one sitting. Uh, it's also important to remember that hearts tend to hold more blood than muscle meat, which means they can significantly reduce in size once they have been dried. So for this reason, we do encourage people to avoid cutting the hearts in half. I know, um, you know, for some landholders, um, trying to get as many baits out of the meat supply that you've got um, uh, is always a priority. But um, if you start cutting the hearts in half, by the time they've dried, they are very, very small. Um, and I'll show you a, a bit of an example of that on the next um, on the next slide. Now, um, now, we need to ensure that baits are the correct side size um, also means that they last longer in the environment and increase the chance of a wild dog coming in contact with them. Um, so, you know, the priority of our program is trying to control dogs um, quickly and humanely. Uh, it's not about, uh, you know, making dogs suffer and, and feeding them baits that are sublethal or substandard. Uh, right, so next slide. Uh, so we do prefer to work with baits that are semi-dried. Uh, and as I mentioned on the last slide, you can see on that picture on the right-hand side there, um, there's a group of cut up heart sections on the right-hand side of that left-hand side picture. And you can see how much um, they dry and how much weight and size they lose uh, once they are dried uh, and ready to be put out. Uh, so drying times before injecting meat can vary depending on the time of year. Uh, the weather and the time of meat being dried. So usually uh, we encourage landholders to dry or semi-dry their baits for around two to seven hours before we inject them. Um, but in you know cooler months and through the winter time, that could be up to 12 hours depending on the weather uh, to get a nice skin on the bait. Um, correct drying, as I just said, uh, correct drying will result in a skin on the meat and no excess blood, uh, but will retain internal moisture, which means they're nice and soft. Um, yeah, and that type of bait tends to draw the poison uh, into the meat as it dries, as opposed to some other baits that may push the poison out again. Um, baits that have been dried too much can be difficult to inject and may expel most of that poison, resulting in sublethal baits. Um, and that type of bait can also take a lot longer to inject for us because it's very, very difficult to get the needle into the bait to inject the poison in there. Now, when we're talking about um, how much 1080 goes into a dog bait, for a 150 gram wet weight piece of meat, uh, it's only 0.2 of a milligram of uh, 1080 poison. Now, that doesn't sound like much. Um, and to most native animals, um, that is nowhere near a lethal dose. And for an example of that, um, a blue tongue lizard would need around 10 dog baits to be lethal. Um, but compared to wild dogs, because of their metabolism and the way they process the poison, 0.2 of a mil is the equivalent uh, amount of 
poison to be able to kill three dogs. And the reason we put that amount in there is because we have to allow for breakdown over time. Right, so baits, um, fresh meat baits can also be injected, uh, provided that the meat's been drained of excess blood. Uh, but the only risk of using fresh meat bait is that it may contain uh, or may continue to lose blood um, after the poison's been added, which may result in uh, a loss in that poison that's in it. Uh, we definitely prefer semi-dried meat baits uh, for injecting um, because it makes a very good quality bait. Right, next slide. So... Here's a bit of an example of some poorly prepared baits um, that we've had to deal with in the past. So in these buckets is a mixture of offal, hearts, uh, and it's all floating in a whole pile of excess blood. Um, so the offal in these um, in these buckets is uh, kidneys, which are obviously too small uh, for dog baits, and uncut livers that are large and need to be cut up on the day. Um, biggest problem in this photo is the excess blood that they're floating in. Uh, it's likely that uh, if we pull those baits out, put them straight onto a uh, an injection table and injected them, that a lot of the 1080 would be lost in excess blood dripping off the table before the baits even left the injection service. Um, baits like this increase the likelihood of a dog getting a sublethal dose and becoming bait shy, and the excess blood containing the 1080 can also result in a greater risk to working dogs or pets. Um, any blood spillage uh, could be a risk, including uh, dried droplets um, left on the back of the ute after they've been put out or transported. Uh, so drying racks, we do encourage landholders uh, in our region to use drying racks. They do definitely make a better product. Um, here's some good examples of them, as you can see in the pictures. Um, they don't have to be pretty, they just need to be functional. Uh, they can be made out of anything really. We've um, injected baits on old shearing bed frames or uh, made out of chicken wire with star droppers. Uh, they just need to make sure that the mesh or the wire is small enough that the baits don't drop through them. Um, probably another really good point that we found is it's good to put chicken wire over the top of them uh, just to stop birds of uh, prey and crows from moving those baits or, you know, knocking them off of the table. Um, if you are uh, drying on racks, oh, sorry, I've just said that bit about, yeah, trying to reduce the birds from being able to move them around. Uh, once the baits are injected, um, they can be left on the racks for up to another 12 hours. Uh, to make sure that they've dried off enough and drawn that uh, poison back in. Um, but, um, you know, we would suggest that any baits that have been sitting out on the drying rack um, should be collected um, and stored in appropriate facilities and not left out on the racks to dry too much. Um, yeah, so we have found some properties prefer to dry their baits overnight uh, to reduce the risk of um, them becoming fly blown or birds getting them. And um, some of the best baits I think Anna and I have ever injected have been dried over a night period before they're collected and brought to an injection service. Um, and as I said before, just try to avoid leaving them on the racks um, for long periods of time, um, particularly in the hotter months, because it'll only be, you know, two or three days and those baits will be rock hard and probably not very palatable for a dog to actually digest. As for transporting, um, injected baits need to be transported in labelled plastic bags or labelled watertight containers that have lids. Um, uh, we've had issues with landholders not doing this in the past, but it's certainly something that we're definitely pushing for at the moment. Um, the directions for use clearly state that baits should be placed directly in containers of sufficient capacity, strength and permeability to prevent leakage of its contents during handling and transport. Um, bait containers can really be anything that is watertight, but, it, um, yeah, but if it has had or will have injected baits in it, it must have a label attached on it so that people know that it's um, that it's containing a, a poison product. Uh, we do bring plastic bags with us to injection services uh, uh, with labels um, 
So if you uh, haven't got containers and you turn up to an injection service, we can help um, with bagging them up to make sure that they're transported appropriately uh, in suitable um, sealed bags. Um, once buckets have been emptied of baits, the containers themselves need to be triple rinsed and can't be used for any other purposes. And once the containers or plastic bags have reached the end of their life, uh, it is important to triple rinse them, um, puncture them, and they either need to be put into landfill or, um, or, you know, if no landfill is available, they can be buried, but they need to be buried um, at least half a metre um, in a disposable pit. Um, burning of containers or bags uh, can only be done in accordance with state legislation. So um, I don't know what the rules are here in South Australia, but I wouldn't suggest burning plastic bags or plastic buckets would be appropriate. Right, so uh, many landholders use 44s for transport of baits. Now, the transport of meat uh, in a half 44 to bring it along to an injection service when it's not injected, you know, there's no issues with that, but transporting of injected baits from an injection service um, has specific rules that need to be adhered to, as we just discussed um, on the previous slide. Um, so any container used to transport baits needs to be sealed and uh, have a lid on it or and uh, to reduce spillage and needs to be watertight to reduce the risk of any fluids escaping. They And as I mentioned before, I can't emphasise it enough, um, all these um, uh, containers that are transporting baits do need to have labels on them to ensure everyone knows that they contain poison. Um, this is a legal requirement um, that must be done to ensure the safe transport of the products. Uh, so all containers, <laughs> as I've said about 10 times now, must have that label on them. Um, if you're going to have injected baits in them, um, uh, we carry a large amount of labels with us uh, to coordinated services. So if you need some, just ask and we'll do our best to provide them to you. Uh, under no circumstances should baits be transported in the cab with you. Um, they must be uh, you know, sealed into buckets and put into the tray of the ute um, or in something similar to that to transport them. Uh, right, so wash down um, after, you know, uh, using baits. Um, use soap and water. This is sufficient enough to break down the 1080 into non-harmful products. Um, try to be very thorough with this, uh, with this and washing down everything, including your car, your containers, your boots, your gloves, and all clothing. Um, don't allow any working dogs or pets near you or the car until this is completed. Uh, we can't emphasise enough, you know, if you've got a small pet dog at home, um, a drop of 1080 the size of a pinhead could be enough um, uh, to, um, you know, poison, poison your pet dog. Uh, so we need to be very careful of that. Treat any blood, uh, liquid or dried, as toxic after you've been to an injection service and wash it down with soap and water. Uh, store uh, empty buckets in a secure spot away from food, children and animals and do not use the containers for any other purpose. Uh, so for bait storage, uh, a lot of our groups in the Sow region have communal um, uh, freezers. Um, we, you don't have to store baits in a freezer, but we do suggest that you need to store baits in locations where only authorised people can access them. Um, we recommend they need to be under a lock and key. Uh, make sure the storage location is signposted um, and that baits, are, uh, if baits are stored there, and that gate signs or something, uh, some sort of sign or a label is put up. Um, to warn people that the poison is in that location. Uh, also keep a copy of the MSDS or the Material Safety Data Sheet uh, in the same location with the baits um, for first aid reference purposes um, if need be, if there is a, um, you know, a poisoning or something that happens on the site. So as I mentioned about freezers before, um, uh, baits can be stored in a freezer once they are semi-dried and they would definitely need to be semi-dried before they go into that freezer um, purely because um, if you put fresh meat baits into the freezer in a bag or in a bucket 
uh, when you bring them out again to put them out, um, they generally stick together and you may lose a whole heap of poison in blood in the bottom of the bag. We have found um, over the years that by semi-drying the baits um, before they're put in a bucket or a, a bag and then frozen, uh, they can generally be put out while they're still frozen, which reduces the smell. It reduces the risk of any um, uh, blood or anything getting spilled anywhere while you're putting them out, and they're just generally a lot easier to work with. One thing we do need to emphasise, though, um, as per the rules and regulations uh, for the approval forms that are signed every time we supply baits to a property, baits can only be stored for up to 12 months and they um, they do need to be used within that 12-month period um, by putting them out. Um, if baits are getting close to the 12 months, we recommend putting them out immediately um, as part of your ground baiting program um, and replace them um, you know, with new ones at the next coordinated injection service. Um, any that have been over 12 months old, really they do need to be destroyed uh, in accordance to the directions for use uh, by deep burial or burning. Uh, and we recommend that um, for properties that do have baits stored um, on their property, that you should have um, a, a register attached to the storage area or the location to keep track of the age of baits uh, to make sure that they are used within that 12 month period. Uh, so, legal, oh, I think we've already been through this stuff. Um, yep, I was probably on the wrong slide before. Um, so, baits older than 12 months need to be destroyed, as I said. Um, you can store baits in a dedicated freezer, provided it's not used for any other purpose, uh, and provided it's labelled and only accessed by authorised people. Um, as I said, baits to be frozen really need to be semi-dried. Um, and that helps you for the thawing process and putting them out. Um, I think that's all I've got. I'm up to the last slide. I guess any questions? Have I still got everyone there? Yes, uh, I'm just responding. <laughs> Sorry, I thought everyone had nodded off or, or left the meeting or something. No, I'm still here. No, thank you, Chris. That was very informative. Uh, one question from me. When the baits are being transported, is it okay to have them on the back of the ute or do they need to be strapped on tied on or anything like that uh well they uh well they need to be in a bucket and they do need to be strapped on the back of the ute the last thing that we want is uh you know a landholder um uh, are you talking about sorry i should clarify are you talking about transporting from an injection service or during putting the baits out i'll go both okay so Transporting the baits on public roads or even private roads, definitely the, the containers that they're in, like we said, need to be labelled. They need to be sealed and they need to be attached to the um, to the vehicle um, to transport them because the last thing we want to do is for you to drive around a corner and for a bucket of baits to be tipped off the back of your ute and you don't realise until you're, you know, 50 k's down the road and, um, you know, a member of the public comes along and their dog eats one of those baits. We certainly don't want that to happen. Um, for baiting on property, and uh, we know from talking to landholders that um, the preferred way of putting baits out is to, you know, have a small bucket that's um, hooked to the driver's side door uh, with a pair of gloves on and a pair of tongs, putting them out as you're driving along your tracks. Um, provided you're on your private property, I don't think there would be much of an issue. And Lindell, please, if I'm saying anything wrong here, please jump in to, um, to tell me otherwise. But for most of our landholders, if they're baiting on their private roads on their property, that I suspect would be acceptable. Correct. Yep. No, all good, sir. Thank Chris. Yep. Thank you for that. Do we have any other questions? No. All right. Thank you all very much for attending. We, unfortunately, Alison's internet is not cooperating tonight.
so we are going to try recording that tomorrow and get the link out to you guys as a separate recording. The recording for tonight will be made available on our landscape website along with Alison's presentation. So if you did miss something or you want to re-watch something or you've talked to your neighbours and they missed it, you can direct them to that site. That will be available hopefully next week. Um, this is going to be a regular occurrence, hopefully, doing these webinars. If you have any topics or um, ideas that you think we should do for these webinars, please let us know as we would love your input into them as we want to make these relevant to you. And if you have any questions that you think up after these presentations, don't hesitate to get in contact with either Chris or I, and we will definitely forward your question on to the relevant person so they can be answered. So, thank you all, and I hope you have a very good night. Thank you. Hanging thank up you, now. Anna. Thank you. Talk to you.